Good morning, everyone. If you haven't get a chance to greet the person beside you, you can turn to them and greet them. Good morning. And welcome them here this morning. Alright, I'd like to invite you to turn your attention to the screen because I'll be reading today's scripture for us from 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 to 12. This passage describes God's sacrificial love through Christ. And if you can follow me, I'll be reading from verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. God has shown us the greatest love of all through the greatest sacrifice of His one and only Son, Jesus Christ. He sent Jesus Christ as an atoning sacrifice for our sins so that we might live through Him, we might learn to love one another just as He has sacrificially and abundantly loved us. So today, as we recall of God's goodness in our life, let us remember that we, we rely on the love of God, on His love, to be able to love one another. Come, friends, let us stand and worship our God of love. Let us proclaim of Christ's love for the world, for He laid aside His majesty. He chose to give up everything so that we might live through Him.
love for us. I invite you to close your eyes, to posture yourself before our loving God. You may choose to lift your hands in adoration to Him. And if you may choose, you may even kneel before our God. For Jesus gave His life to redeem us and to save our souls. He is worthy of all honour all praise. Let us surrender everything that is hindering us from coming before Him. And we thank you, Jesus, that it is your work on the cross that draws us to you. Nothing that we have done could have made you close the door of your heart to us. In your presence, all things are new. And here before you, we continue to open up our hearts to you. Help us surrender our thoughts, our anxious thoughts to you. And help us to worship you with our heart and with our voices, Lord. One voice, let us sing the chorus again. Just 
changed by the love that you give. We thank you, Jesus, for your love, for laying down your life to save our souls. We ask that you continue to show us what it means to have a humble heart and to love the people in the world like you. i
dear Heavenly Father, thank you for showing us the greatest example of love. And we pray, Lord, let there be love among us, love that is shown and seen from the love of yours. Through your greatest sacrifice on the cross, Jesus Christ has atoned for our sins. For he is the great high priest who is able to empathize with our weaknesses as he has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So Lord, we can trust that your work on the cross, your death and resurrection has already brought about forgiveness and the promised Holy Spirit in our lives that will transform our hearts, that will change us from deep within. We ask that you fill us with your heart's desire to love one another as you have abundantly loved us. Enable us to exercise patience, kindness. Let us honour one another with our words. We pray that you help us seek the interests of others before ours. Cause us to put off, put off envy put off a boastful heart, any pride, anger, and any evil thoughts. And above all, we pray you help us persevere, Lord. Help us never give up loving one another. Because by loving one another the way that you have directed us, we believe that everyone will know that we are your disciples. We commit the rest of the time we have into your hands and the giving of the tithes and offering, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. You know, beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, God does not leave us clueless in a way that we are to love one another. God gave us an excellent, in fact, a perfect model in Acts chapter 2. And as the Spirit, Christ ascended, the Spirit came upon the church. The Spirit came upon all of us who have professed our faith in Jesus. Acts chapter 2 reminds us the people, you and I, came together and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, the breaking of bread that we observe once a month, and to prayer. And all the believers were together like that. They had everything in common because they sold their property and possession to give to everyone who had need. And day by day, they met together. I want to encourage you, yesterday when we were at our CC retreat, one of the love agenda that has come forth is to set up a members fund so that whenever there are needy people among us, we can use some of our collected resources like that to support one another in love. And I think that is a wonderful initiative. So as we give to the Lord this morning, I want you to know that these resources are all from God. And let us wisely use it to exemplify Christ's love for us by our love for one another and also more so for people, for those that are in the needy country. So let me just pray and I'll collect our ties. Thank you, God, that you first love us, that we may love one another. Thank you, God, that it is not just materially that you have blessed and loved us, you have given your greatest gift, your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, so that we may have life and have it to the full. And the word full, Lord, you say, is an abundant life. We recount the week and we say, yes, Lord, by your grace, we have lived a life of abundance. As we give back to you, it is a worship of who you are, the giver of all things. As we give back to you, we ask God for wisdom in the stewardship of that we have collected as a congregation together for your glory as you have instructed us and demonstrated to us how we are to live our life together as a family. We give thanks in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's collect our tithes and offering. 
I think we will give you more instruction. Go ahead. I'll give you more instructions about this whole thing about members care fund. But I'm excited about that. Okay, let me pray and we will dismiss our children and we will enter or read God's word together according to the instruction from Acts chapter 2. Father Lord, thank you for the authority of your word, the faithfulness of um, the scripture itself that instructs us in a way that we are to live and by our faithful, if you will, Lord, help us in our, to faithfully obey that you have instructed I trust and I know, God, that exemplify the love of yours. And by that, O oh God, I know that people will see the love that you have for the world today. We give thanks again for this morning, for everyone gathered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Children, you are dismissed. The rest of you, would you turn your Bible, um, electronic or physical, to 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 to 12. Bye bye. <laughs> they are lovely. Thank you, Joseph. I don't know whether I've repeated that so often, but time really flies. We are in the end last Sunday of November. And entering into next week, you know there is a series of Christmas related service. But every Sunday is a Christmas, it's a gospel centric opportunity to preach to share the gospel. But on the next three Sundays, specifically even into the Christmas Eve itself, uh, 24th, we're going to have a series of sermons that are um, talking about Christ and we're going to do a series on Matthew chapter 1 and chapter 2 for that purpose. And then we'll come to the end of the year and it's the end of 2023. Woo! I want to thank all of you for coming together last Sunday for our first membership meeting. Um, by your presence, it reveals a certain degree of spiritual maturity because we see in each other a commitment to grow together. I think you are interested in how God is moving in and through Ex-Baptist Church. Uh, I count you as my fellow brothers and sisters, almost as Jesus says, fellow servant of the Lord, to battle on in our spiritual faith and to extend that faith to the people around us. Yesterday, at our CC retreat, we had an opportunity to look through the membership list, one and all of you, and to begin to give thanks for the signs of growth and life that we are beginning to see and we have continuously seen in many of you. If you ask me what is that measure of growth, and you've got to ask yourself the question personally as the year end, what is your measure of growth? Have you grown in the year 2023? There are only two measures, yardstick, to understand whether you have grown broadly, but specifically also your love for one another and your love for God. There is no order. It is very naive to say that, hey, I've grown in my love for God, but I seem to have not grown in my love for one another. It doesn't make sense because the love for one another and the love of God is two sides of the same coin. When God moves in our heart and we begin to grapple and understand God's love, we begin to love one another. And then we ask ourselves, Roy, love is a very broad word. Sometimes we define it on our own. Then the Bible teaches us that if you love me, you are obeying my commandments. Now it gets a bit more specific. If I'm saying that, Lord, I have loved you as I best I could understand it, I begin to recount incidences this year that perhaps I had a struggle of obeying a certain commandment. Maybe one of the Ten Commandments of um, not murdering, not having anger, and I begin to deal with it, I think you are growing. So let's return back to the scripture. 
is as we proceed to this year end and we tend to also evaluate, I pray that you will use the scripture to begin to reflect whether have you grown in your love for God and your love for one another. So the Ten Commandments uh, in Exodus 20 is a wonderful guide. It is still relevant in all ways. If you need a further elaboration, Jesus began to speak about the Ten Commandments in the Sermon of the Mount at Matthew 5 and 7 and many of the passages that we have covered in this wonderful, glorious year, God has given as a gift to all of us. This morning, I want to carry on. I want to continue to take the opportunity to encourage us to strengthen and to deepen our love towards one another, especially in this local church called Ex Baptist Church. Have we grown in our love for one another? It's a question. And I think we have. But let us press in and press on because I don't want us to just love that group of people that I'm comfortable with and I've known. Honestly, in our evaluation yesterday, we will confess. And I say is that, hey, there are people that we know about and we may not know personally. There are people that we have seen growth, but we cannot even pinpoint and understand exactly which area of growth that has happened. So I think in a congregation, God designed us to know one another, to have at least engagement with one another spiritually, that we can pray and understand what are the things that we are struggling with and what are the things that we are growing in. Amen? And that's why we want to do on a Sunday like that. Three very key reasons I can send again all this out. I think there are a lot of words, but I want to capture that for us. Three motivation. Three impetus, you put it, because by our love for one another, Scripture will say that it is an assurance that I am safe because God is love. I will elaborate a bit about that shortly. The second reason, by loving one another, and we are compelled to love one another because we see God's love demonstrated, manifested through Christ Jesus for us. We are compelled to then love one another. And the third impetus that we will love one another because by loving one another, we are making God's love visible to a community, to a people, to a nation that is need, that is that needs that there is a desperate need for God. So in one chap- chapter our uh, one John chapter four, verse seven to twelve, we see these three compelling reasons. And I like all of us to stand as a congregation to read God's word together. Would you stand with me, please? And we'll read in the ESV version. One, two, three. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His one own Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. Please be seated, brothers and sisters. This is the sermon outline. You can almost capture that already in a plain reading of Scripture. But allow me the next 20 minutes or so just to expound on that. In verse 7 to 8, we can see the essence of God is love. And we'll dwell upon that shortly. In verse 9 to 11, we can see the love that of God that is manifested through Christ. And in verse 12, the love that God designed since creation shall be perfected, complete, make whole in the church. And I only have a very simple but enduring and a, a, a pursuit that we are press in on. Christians are to love one another. Christians are to love one another. Don't let it be so familiar that we have lack in our practicing of it. Christians are to love one another. Let's dive into the scripture once again, verse 7 to verse 
8, the essence of God is love. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And in verse 8, the ending, because God is love. One of the key essence, the being of God is love. Verse 8 says, God is love. In other words, the substance, the reality of God, whom we worship, is love. But we must ask a deeper question. What is it about God that made love a necessary and essential part of His nature? Sure, I'm not discounting the fact that God is truth, God is light, but Scripture says God is love. What is it about God that makes love an essential nature? I want to suggest, first and foremost, the God that we worship is a relational God. Starting before any creation, God exists as a triune God. And you must understand a triune God means God ex exists in a distinct three-person God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And because there is God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Father, they relate to one another. Any form of relationship exists on the basis of love. God is a triune God, and therefore the relationship that happens between the triune God is a relationship of love. It could have stopped there, people. But God extended and invited Adam and Eve at creation into that fellowship and that relationship of love. Wow! He could have stopped there. But He extended His love relationship to Adam and Eve. God chose to create human mankind because He desires to extend His love and usher us into his love relationship in the triune God. They were joined, Adam and Eve were joined into a fellowship with the triune God until it was broken by disobedience. And that was the start to me, the history of that redemption and that restoration of you and I into that perfect triune love relationship with why is love an essential nature? The God that we worship is a relational God. We who have entered into this relationship, into God's love, must appreciate and understand this is so different from many, any other religion. That God reaches out to us in love in order to relate to us. So let us appreciate this important essence of God. It is a stark contrast to many other gods. God's love is not like ours. God's love is not like any other love. We must draw our cue that God's love is a supreme love. And by that I mean it is the highest form of love, it is the best form of love, and it is the ultimate form of love. Today, you and I use the language, the word love in various contexts, and that is right. We will say, I love my spouse, I love my children, I love my parents, I love my grandparents. Some of us would say, who are pet lovers, I love my cats and my dogs. Sure. I love my popcorn when I'm enjoying a movie. Sure. I love that Korean drama, and these are wonderful stuff. Essentially, when we say love, this, some of these examples falls into one of these two categories. It either means, first and foremost, a romantic, com a passionate love between perhaps even spouses, uh, marriage uh, people, or sometimes even among uh, family members and friends, it is a passionate romantic love that involves attraction and desire. Perhaps an insatisfiable kind of desire for something or someone we could even go crazy over food. We could, some of us go crazy over cars. And some of us could go crazy over people. 
Yeah, we have seen people queuing long hours just to attend a concert and I can't appreciate that. But I'm going to honour that and respect that. But there are people who are crazy over many things. And some of us are willing to travel, to, to spend and to satisfy certain desires. These are what they call an eros love. The second nature of it is an intimate, authentic friendship that involves, again, a mutual care, as we do, rightfully, with humankind, a sense of loyalty to one another. This love is what they call a filio, a filia love, a relationship between two persons, people of common interest when we are gathered together. But God's love and the love that God commands us to love one another is what they call an agape love. It is an empathetic, universal love that involves selflessness. It involves compassion for all living beings. I need to repeat that for us. When God loves, He loves unconditionally. When God loves, He loves with, He has a universal and an empathetic love that involves selflessness. We know that through Christ. It involves compassion and it involves all living beings. Christ died for the world. Everyone. And God's love for us, I, re I realize that it is unconditional. So in other words, people, when God chose to create us and love us, He did not need to find a reason to love us. Oh, you are so cute. Oh, you are good. You have a good nature. Oh, you are bad, man. Nah. No, he doesn't, do, he doesn't do that. God's love is absolutely without cause or without condition. He loves us just as we are. He loves us just as we are. He said, it doesn't make sense, Roy. That's precisely the point of a, a supreme love. God loves us unconditionally. God's love is not like any other love. Romans 5, verse 6 to 8, you see, just at the right time, when we were still sinners, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone perhaps might possibly die, there to die. But this is the truth. God demonstrates His own love for us in this while we were still sinners. While well, in every sense there was nothing worthy and good within us, Scripture says Christ died for you. Christ's love continues to be poured out for us if we are true to ourselves today, that we are still very much sinners within us. Christ died for you. Christ loved you for who you are. God loves the least deserving and therefore, I want you to know God love is supreme. We love sometimes because people we deem the persons worthy of our love. Am I not right? But what is a supreme love? To love somebody who is unworthy, in your opinion, to love. But God counts all of you and I worthy. The story was told of an older sibling telling a younger sibling. He was saying, you should stop doing that, else daddy will not love you. And the daddy sat at the corner, overheard the conversation and, says, and replied, no sons, that's not true. I will always love both of you no matter what you do. It's just that if you are obedient, I will love you with a love that gladdens my heart. But when you don't, when you are disobedient, I will still love you. But sometimes with a love that grieves and saddens my heart. God loves unconditionally. And do I want to obey God and gladden His heart? Or do I want to disobey God and sadden His heart? That has been our experience in the reading of the Old Testament. Does God faithfully, continuously love His people? Just this morning when I was revising Joshua chapter 1, when God says, I will never leave you or forsake you, did he know that his own people is going to again defile God's law? He knew it. But that is the example of what it means to love unconditionally. He says, I will never leave you. 
I will never forsake you. Wow, that's love. God's love for all of us is unconditional. And that's how God loves Israel. That's how God continuously loves all of us. God's love is not dependent on our actions or behaviour. May I say that God's love is independent of whether you are good or bad, lovely or unlovely. God loves us and He continues to love us yesterday, today and forever. Jeremiah 31 verse 3 says, I have loved you, past tense, I have loved you, continuous with an everlasting love. Wow, God's love is unending and unconditional. What is the implication? We see that in that same verse. Therefore, beloved, you, my loved ones, love one another. Love one another because love is from God. And second of which, whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever has been born of God, whoever claims that you know God, these people love. True followers of Jesus Christ are characterized by God's unconditional love for one another. I don't know whether sometimes you sit under a sermon like that and say, Lord, um, Roy, that doesn't really look like me. We are all a work to perfection. The important thing is grow. Grow in your love for one another. I want to establish the basis of why I dare to say that you are characterized, or at least I believe from the scripture that God's love is in us for many ways and many reasons. In the image of God, God created Adam and Eve. When they disobeyed God, that image is distorted, at least it doesn't represent truly in the form of Adam and Eve, and likewise for any of us who sin. At your point of salvation, I need you to know something miraculous has happened. When I pray to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, when I confess Him as my Lord and my God, a few things happen. You are given a new heart. You are given a new heart, the scripture says, now to obey God. And the Spirit comes upon you. The triune God, remember? Holy Spirit comes upon us. And what is the first fruit of the Holy Spirit? Love joy, peace, patience, kindness. What it means for me is that when I pray to receive Jesus as my Lord and Saviour, you are restored into a love relationship with the triune God and the essence is love. We just need to understand some of these deep truths and doctrines and now begin to say, hey, I'm no longer the same. I have the capacity to love because God is in me. And so we learn together. We shape one another. We ask the scripture to teach us now how to love one another. True followers of Jesus Christ are characterized by our love for one another. Would there be occasion, season that I don't love? For sure, yes. It is like the situation, as I said, in Adam and Eve. Wow. The reality, as I said, God's love is present, is unconditional. Then I suggest that it takes a very deliberate, uncompromising effort to continuously surrender ourselves to God in order to obey His instruction to love. It means a conscious effort. Salvation is done and secured. It is the sanctification that requires us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And I pray we won't stagnate at where we are. We will grow in that sanctification process. Thus, in such season, it is important when we evaluate and say, Hey, Lord, my love for others, one another, seems to be demanding, seems to be not present. It is important for us to confess and to repent from whatever is causing us not to love for one another. There are many factors. Love for things. A deceitful heart, a heart hardened. And then to return to God. Before I move to our next segment, I want to take, bring us to an awareness that our love for one another is an outcome, a consequence 
I must qualify to say that love for one another is not a precondition for being safe, for, to be safe. Salvation, Scripture says, is by grace through faith in the completed work of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not our doing, it's a gift of God. Sometimes we perceive and we turn it around and say, in order to be safe, I must love one another. Nope. So in verse 7 and 8, we are exhorted to love one another because God is love. As believers, we take on God's nature of unconditional love for one another. How do we understand, appreciate, practice this unconditional love? God does not leave us clueless. In the next segment, we will see God's love manifested, which means make known, make clear to all of us through the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. In this is love of God. The love of God was made manifest among us. And how did He do it? God sent His only Son into the world. And I skip it a bit more. He loved us and He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sin. So in verse 9, the love of God was made manifest among humankind. It was revealed, made clear. God's love is revealed clearly, openly, with nothing concealed. Paul would use the language in Ephesians, it was previously a mystery. Now it has been made known to us, God's love. God sent His one and only Son, Jesus, to die on, into the world. You need to know that Jesus, as we celebrate Christmas, remember Christmas, God appeared in human flesh. That itself is making God's love visible in the presence, the human form of God. And he then later demonstrate what it means to love by his faith and his deeds. Brothers and sisters, as we celebrate Christmas shortly, I don't know about you. We need to just revisit that. We need to know that every account of Jesus' birth, his life, his ministry, crucifixion on the cross and his resurrection are all true accounts. Sometimes we don't revisit that. It's as if that it was one of the other story that we neglect to know that it was a true, validated account. It was witnessed by many beyond Christian writers. And it was recorded consistently for us, not one, not two, not three, even the four gospel. But there's only one gospel four accounts, four different person writing a true one gospel account for all of us. But accounts alone are not the point. The, what is the point of Jesus' account, true account then? We see that in verse 10. He loved us and He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sin. God loves us and that He demonstrates that by Christ's death on the cross. It is a big word, propitiation for our sin. It means to say it is a sacrifice that bears God's wrath and turns it into a favour. Propitiation will simply mean a sacrifice. Jesus became the sacrificial lamb which was to be ours. He bore God's wrath and He turns God's wrath to our favour. We were deserving of God's wrath but God, Christ, turned it into our favour. We were deserving of God's divine wrath because of our sins, our disobedience and our rejection of God. Because of our sin, there is a price and a penalty to be made. But because of love, God sent Jesus to be the payment, the propitiation, the sacrifice needed to bring us back into a relationship with God. Such is the manifestation of God's love through Jesus Christ on the cross, it was a divine exchange. Instead of wrath, God gave us life. Instead of death, 
God gave us eternal life. It was an exchange where God took all our unloveliness and gave us His unconditional love. So that, verse 9, we might live through Him. So that we might live through Him. Eternal life is not simply a life that never ends. It is a full life that is unending. Eternal life is an abundant life with God the Creator. It is about being in a love relationship with the God of love. Is your relationship with God characterized? centered upon a love for one another today. It is also therefore a life that is filled and overflowing because the Spirit of God is in us. Filled and overflowing with love for one another, with joy. Do I see joy among us today? (laughs) Would there be peace among us? Forbearance kindness to one another, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Hey, people, the fruit of the Spirit is not uh, like, you know, a character and uh, that's I am, I'm love, I'm joy, I'm peace, I'm patient. No! Can you see these characters are all relational traits to be exercised in a relationship? It is like that, the fruit of the Spirit, because it is a relational God, we, when we are filled with it, we exercise these things. That is, I think, what we truly want and need today as a congregation, as a Christian. So to some of us who have yet to receive this life that I mentioned here, eternal life, I urge you to consider God's love for you and begin to put your faith in Jesus today. I invite you to speak to any of us immediately after our service this morning We are glad to engage with you to hear your questions and to respond together. My challenge, my humble plea to all of us, God has given us eternal life and God has intended it for us to live it, our life, to the full. It doesn't mean that we will not have disappointment. It doesn't mean that there will not be discouragement nor diseases that comes upon us. It doesn't mean that there will be no destruction in the world or even in relationship, it doesn't mean that death will not come. But what it means is that God's love is with you through and every through all of these circumstances of your life and therefore put on the spirit in your life. The spirit of love, of joy, of peace, of patience, of kindness and goodness. It means experiencing Christ's love through all of them. Because God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We are compelled to love one another. We are not just given the capacity to love because of the nature of God dwelling within us. We have been called to this love because now Christ has become the model of that love for my life and for the life of the world. Greater love has no man than this, said Jesus, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Christ's love is a sacrificial love. It is a selfless love. It must move beyond your comfort zone to love one another. And that's what God does for you and I. This love is a sacrificial love. And this love is so missing in Christianity today, we come and we say, I don't feel anything today. It's about me, 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 fix me, make me happy, make me satisfied. Sadly, I think many of us approach God and approach God's people gathering like that with such an attitude. Feed me, Lord. Serve me. We want music, the worship music to suit to our tune. <laughs> And sometimes even our our tune and our ears, that kind of music is what I like. 
Can you see how consumer we have become in a secular world? Give me the kind of preacher that perhaps will entertain us. We want people to come towards us to serve us. And sometimes people, hey, how are you doing today? Huh? You feel offended and like as if you have intruded into my personal zone. Excuse me. We are reaching out to one another. I'm interested in your life. If you are only interested in your own life, we have not understood Christ's love for our lives together. So it's not about, you come and sometimes it's not about, not about Christ, it's not about others, it's about me. Beloved, brothers and sisters, we have seen the model. We have seen an example through Christ Jesus. He himself says, I come not to be served, but to serve. I've been challenging some of us to be in serving. I mean, service can take in many forms, but in a basic, at least, all men, women, young adults, should be serving in some form of ministry. And I'll leave you to think carefully what it means. So search the Lord. Doesn't make sense that on a Sunday, 10% of the congregation is serving, 90% is being served. Doesn't make sense. How does that exemplify Christ in our gathering when people come? So I'm speaking in love according to the scripture. Just consider some of these things. John 13, Jesus came to the surprise not to just host the meal. He squat down and he began to wash each the disciples' feet. He said, you call me teacher and Lord and rightly so I am, for that is what I am. And now that I, the Lord your God, the teacher, have washed, washed your feet, you should also wash one another's. I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you, God says. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, brothers and sisters, you'll be blessed if you do that. You never need to ask a question, what does it mean to love somebody else? It means to make sacrifice. It means to serve one another. It means commitment and not consumerism. What is our attitude when we come to this morning's gathering? May I ask, is it about you? Is it to serve or to be served? Is it to minister or to be ministered? May the Lord help us in this area of church life and growth together. So in this second segment, our second compelling reason to love one another is because of Christ's love for us on the cross. We are to love one another unconditionally. We are to love one another sacrificially. Verse 12, No one has seen God. If we do love one another, God's Spirit abides in us as He does, and His love is then perfected in us. John's point here is simple. He's pointing to the fact that Obviously, nobody sees God for the very simple reason because God is holy, we are unholy. Old Testament teaches us that the moment any of us could see God, we will be struck dead because of the sin within us. So how are people ever going to catch a glimpse? I wouldn't say see God, inverted comma, to see God, that image, the character and that nature. Ladies and gentlemen, is the church. God says in His word here, it is when we love one another, when God's nature of love is demonstrated by our love for one another, the Spirit lives within us. His love is perfected in us. His love is not even, may I say, perfected in Christ because that was not the outcome by itself. It is that the world may come to know God through the testimony of the church today. So it is not just words that talks about the gospel. That is important. It is about life with one another that also reveals the gospel. By our love for one another, God is being revealed. 
by our love for one another, let me introduce this word. We are adorning the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, you may think of some jewelry adornment, but what it simply means in the root word to adorn the gospel is to put in proper order. That is how a church is supposed to be in that order. Restore that order as a Christian. When we do that, we become, we, we reveal the beauty of the gospel. We are adorning the gospel by our love for one another. The unseen God becomes seen, inverted comma, by our love for one another. By our love for one another, His love is perfected in us. So therefore, the key question, as I sum it all up for this morning, is to ask ourselves to evaluate maybe as a church together at this coming close. When the world looks at us, the church, do they see an unconditional love for one another? When a visitor come and join us, do they see an unconditional love for one another that can only be explained by a supernatural work that has taken place in this congregation? Who are the other one? Who are the one another? I want to suggest, and I'm not wrong, in the one another in the 50 plus times, just go and search a Bible gateway or whatever, search for one another 50 times plus that this phrase, one another, appears in the New Testament, the context and the immediate application was the local church. The 50 plus times that this one another, depending on what, what version you use, appears in the New Testament, that one another, the context and the immediate application was addressed to a local church. This I believe and therefore I speak in the power of the Holy Spirit, God, help us, I pray, to strengthen and to deepen our love for one another moving forward. I want to leave us with nine biblical ways. I tell you, the scripture is, I tell you, not clueless. It's only whether we obey enough. Again, just jot some of these things down. The, the Bible reference I've Put it for us because I just want to make a point that the Bible is in, instructional and almost uh, not exhaustive in its form and instruction. First and foremost, care for one another physically and spiritually. I will send this out if you need to just drop me a text. Forget about the references down there. There are too many. <laughs> These verses, when I was reading through, spoke a lot about caring for one another Literally, first by sharing and giving what you already have. It literally means giving your finances. And maybe in modern state term, learn to share to some of us who are driving, learn to give, share your cars. Some of us who have houses, learn to open up your house to those in need. That is an exemplification of what it means to care for one another physically, spiritually. To watch over one another and to hold one another accountable. Some of the words that have surfaced in these verses would mean to watch over one another doesn't mean watch over. It means to correct. Some of the words, it means to restore. It means to warn. It means to consider others more significant than yourself. That means to watch over one another. I hold no apologies when I don't see you on Sunday. If I can remember that, I will surely drop you a text. I make it a point because I hold myself responsible as a shepherd to know whether my sheep are around on Sunday. We will hold no apologies when sometimes when we feel things are not right. Just to correct because it is love. To walk with you, just to restore you, that is love and to warn you. And let us do that together, even for a congregation to your elders. Likewise, 
do to one another that is no one above another. You are significant. Your elders are significant. Your little boy and girl is significant. She work to edify one another. The word in the scripture says, therefore, to build up one another, and you need more, it means to teach. Titus 2, to some of us who have gathered yesterday, Titus 2 repeatedly says, young woman, older woman, you are to teach the younger woman. Older men, likewise, you are to teach the younger men. That means to work, to edify one another, to be intentional about it, to equip, to speak the truth in love, to encourage one another, to build one another up, to serve one another. Number four, it means to bear with one another. It means to forgive one another. It means to bear with the failings of the weak. Sometimes it could be just competency. And honestly, even if it's a character weakness, it is only the grace of God that brings about a transformation. So we learn to bear with the failings of the weak. It means, as the scripture says, therefore we're going to put on compassionate heart, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Number five, to pray for one another. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. On this note, I'd like you to know I'm going to collapse, put away with the watchman prayer group. I think some of you have heard me say that. Because I count you, 56 of you, members of our congregation, from now onward, any prayer request, I will send to the whole church. And because of the commandment to love one another, I urge you when you receive it, please pray for one another. By praying for one another, we learn to love one another. By knowing what are the struggles and the challenges, health, uh, moving of house, I don't know, any prayer request, give me the permission to share it. We will share with the rest of us because we need to know what's happening and begin to pray for one another. I think that's one form that must take place. So I'm going to give out also on a second note as an application, I'm going to give out a membership list that I've showed last Sunday to every one of us and I'm going to plead with you if you could, not almost like an if you could, please, maybe just pick up one member's name per day and begin to pray. If there's 56 of us, you only take two months already before you revisit that cycle again. Will we do that? If your schedule really does not permit, give yourself that flexibility, maybe on a weekend, five names, and begin to pray. I'm okay with that. What's my intent? Love one another by praying. Number six, to keep away from those who destroy the church. And more specifically, to watch out, to avoid those that teach and promote false doctrines. Scripture says, do not even associate with such people. Our job together as a congregation, to jealously guard the doctrines spoken on the pulpit. The duty of every one of us to watch out for one another, even in the ideas that we are bringing across. Sometimes we are just exposed to too many YouTubes. I warn you, be careful. I'm glad to converse with you, even listening to other churches' sermon. Just be careful what you are listening to because some of these things need to be discussed and understood and where we are in our faith and doctrines. So just be careful, myself included. Seven, to reject evaluating people by worldly standards. Scripture says, whoever will be first among you must be your slave. We are to love one another. We are to bless those who persecute you, bless those who curse you. Number eight and nine, to contend together with the gospel. It means in the scriptures down there, to strive side by side for the faith of the gospel. That's what we are doing weekly, people. And you need it more specifically than in the next three to four weeks. That's what our desire is. Every one of us contending together for the gospel. And therefore, our life, Scripture says, must be worthy of the gospel. So it's not just external. It is working out my life. It is working out each other's life together for the gospel. And number nine, to be examples to one another. To be examples to one another. I think we understand that. 
Brothers and sisters, I must say of the 50 times, I've only listed some of them. <laughs> I don't have that time to go through everything. But I want to leave you with just this nine, not because it's more important or not, but for us enough to discuss through, to think through, and to act on them in loving one another. Let us love one another because we see that God is love. When we love one another, it is an assurance of our faith in God. We are in that relationship of love with God. Let us love one another because we are compelled to do that as we look at God's love manifested on the cross through Christ. Let us love one another because our love for one another makes visible God's love to a world that is in desperate need of that. What is our reasonable response to God and His love? Brothers and sisters, beloved, let us love every one another in this local church unconditionally, sacrificially. I pray we will intentionally act on these nine, among many others, biblical ways to love one another. Let me invite the worship team to come forward. There is a hymn that is rich in doctrine. You know, when we desire now to act upon what we have heard, I need all of us time and again to deepen and strengthen ourselves in the doctrine, the teaching of God's love. Because only through that, we are compelled, we are glad, we are sacrificially, we are willingly, happily going to love one another. Let us stand together as we sing a response song, Love Divine or Love Excelling.